Hello again, you sick, twisted weather freaks, and Happy New Year, everybody. Welcome to another fun-filled, action-packed, and intellectually stimulating edition of This Week in Weather. I'm your host, meteorologist, and all-around Chesterfield playboy, DT from weatherist.com. You're a colonel of confusion, the captain of catastrophe, the commander of chaos. It's a Saturday evening, yes it is, at 11 p.m., 8 p.m. on the West Coast. Let's talk weather. Why the heck not? I mean, seriously, what could be more fun? Lots of topics to talk about this week. Uh, ice, the ice event, obviously, in the northern mid-Atlantic and interior New England coming up here. Uh, the January 2nd and 3rd snowstorm, we'll talk about that. And it essentially was an event which was triggered by the polar vortex coming southward. We'll talk about the severe Arctic blast coming here January 5th through the 8th, which are very common in positive teenage patterns. If you recall a couple of videos ago and on the Facebook, I pointed this out, that when in January in particular, when you have positive teenage patterns, you often have severe Arctic outbreaks. We saw this in the winter of 84-85 and the winter of 93-94. Both those winters featured you know, not great snowstorm patterns, but they were very, very cold and a lot of uh, ma major Arctic outbreaks. And then, of course, the coming warm-up, which will be a typical January thaw and it won't last. So let's get right to it. We'll talk about first the ice event. Now, this is the 12Z 4-kilometer NAM. This is from Saturday, the Saturday run, okay? Now, I know we're almost up to the new run, but we'll use this one. Now, we can see scattered showers in central and southern Virginia, but, and the cold front here moving in for, across the Great Lakes and through Chicago where the snow is coming in pretty good there already. But if we look at our temperatures, uh, temperatures are actually holding on, in a lot of portions of Virginia here uh, above 32 degrees in here. See this? Now look at Pennsylvania and northern Maryland. It's still well, look at it, very cold up in whole this area. But the showers right now at 1 a.m. in Virginia are still looking at or above freezing. So there may be a little bit of freezing right here, but it's not a big deal. Now by 7 o'clock Sunday morning, the precip line is up to the Pennsylvania-Maryland border. And we can see this uh, very significant snowstorm up all going on in here, of course. But uh, with regard to the temperatures here, Sunday 7 a.m., again, Virginia... Everybody's above freezing. North Central Maryland are getting close to freezing, but look at Pennsylvania and New York State. But the precip isn't there yet, so it's going to be a race against time. Obviously, with the heavy snow cover and the cold conditions, it'll probably be some freezing rain in those areas north of the Maryland-Pennsylvania border. That's where the really significant stuff will be in terms of the icing. But this is not a big event either way. It's just a lot of light icing here. And we can see this on the precipitation. This is a 1 o'clock Sunday afternoon. Again, the precip is getting up into here where it's probably below freezing now, and we're getting some icing here. Look at this big snowstorm right here. Woof. A lot of, uh, you know, 8 to 12 inches of snow in this whole area, I would think. 8 to 12 in here. Very nice snowstorm for the Ohio Valley. But I digress. All right, let's go on to the next thing. Now, this is the snowstorm book. There are two volumes to it, Northeast Snowstorms. I occasionally post this picture and show folks. If you're a weather nut and you love snowstorms, this is the book to get. There are now 38 different snowstorms, which they've studied now since 1955, yes. Up and down the uh, Northeast. Now, the Northeast, for practical purposes, consists of two regions, the Mid-Atlantic region and New England. And uh, if you notice the authors here, Paul Coson and Hughes Luchlini, Coson of the Weather Channel fame and the... Uh, uh, I'm now working back at NWS at the World, at the Weather Prediction Center. And then Dr. L Dr. Louis Uccellini, who's now the director of the National Weather Service, and is going to do a lot of good things, uh, including major upgrades to the computers and the GFS. So uh, this, But this is the book. You should get it from the AMS if you can. It's worth every penny of it. Now, that book tells us certain things, that for all the big East Coast snowstorms, you must have these items. Now, that doesn't mean you can't get any snow in the Northeast. Obviously, you can. But to get the big snowstorm storms, you know, the, the ones where hammered, like the metropolitan areas and the big snowstorms, you have to have these things. A negative Arctic oscillation. You have to have a negative NAO or one which is going from positive to negative in a very sharp transition. Uh, a 50-50 low. We'll talk about that in a second. And then the trough axis has to be over the Midwest. That is to say, the upper level energy, the 500 millibar trough, should have a neutral tilt over the Mississippi River and then develop a negative tilt by the time it gets to the Appalachian Mountains. And, of course, don't forget the cold air. Now, the 50-50 low is this feature here. This is a feature which exists at the surface and at the upper levels of the atmosphere. It's a large ocean storm which has become trapped or parked over Newfoundland, Canada. And what that feature does is... Let me point it out to you so you can see it right here. 
There's the 50-50 low. See it? Now, there's our surface high, okay? So sometimes the high, as you know, slides off the coast and you lose the cold air. Well, when a big East Coast snowstorm, you don't lose the cold air. Why? Because of this feature right in here, the 50-50 low. It blocks this high from moving out to sea. It can't go out to sea. So the cold air comes southward, and you keep your cold air damming pattern, and you have a big snowstorm. That's why the 50-50 low is so important. If you don't have that, a lot of times you will lose your cold air over Washington, Baltimore, Philly, New York, and Boston. Um, and, you know, New Jersey, coastal Connecticut, so on and so forth. So that's why that 50-50 low is so important. Now, there is a way of getting around that if you don't have a 50-50 low. When the polar vortex gets suppressed or displaced over southeastern Canada, it can act as a de facto 50-50 low. And we'll see what I'm talking about. Now, this comes from November of uh, 2009. This is an upper air map from November 2009. Here we have a huge negative NAO centered, a huge block, from, that has been moved in from Greenland into northern Canada, the northern part of Hudson's Bay. And what it's doing is it is suppressing the polar vortex southward into the Great Lakes. And this developed a huge early season snowstorm for the Great Lakes in northern New England. But this is an example of how the polar vortex gets shoved southward. Normally this feature is not over the Great Lakes, it's over Hudson's Bay. You see this feature right here? Normally this feature is over in here. But the NEL has forced it southward, and that's why it happened. This is just a, a, a case to show you what it looks like, okay? Good. Now, the, one of the best cases of, the biggest, of a major East Coast snowstorm where you had a suppressed or displaced full of vortex was January 1996, the January 29th and 30th storm. This was a surface map, a rapidly developing low that came up the coast, off of New Jersey. It became a blizzard for many places. It bombed out over Vermont, as you can see here. A huge Arctic outbreak coming in behind it. And what happened is, is that this was January 27th, 1966. There's the polar vortex, as you can see right here. And I'll highlight it so you can see it. It's right in here, okay? There's your negative NAO, there's your ridge, and so on and so forth. Now, what's going to happen is this thing is going to swing through, and it's going to cause the surface. It's going to merge with this system here, and you're going to get your big storm. But there's the case of the polar vortex being suppressed. Look how far south it is. It's over the Great Lakes. It's not normally there, as you can see. And then, if, and then it merges with this system right here as you can see, right in there, and you're going to get your big storm. And then finally, boom, there it is. Now, at this point, the polar vortex splits into two pieces. One piece goes here, one piece goes here, and then this feature comes in, and they phase, and you get your big storm on the East Coast, which is exactly what happened. So that's the best case of a suppressed polar vortex. Now, this is the GFS on uh, December 20, uh, I believe it was 28th or 29th. Is that the time frame on this? Yeah, it was. And for uh, 264 hours out, um, December 23rd, I believe it was. Yes, December 23rd. And again, you can see a number of different strong signals that there was going to be a big storm on the East Coast. And I posted this map on Facebook. So this is how you can use the ensembles to get a clue that something significant might be happening. This was the first guess map. And those numbers represent probabilities of 0 to 2, 2 to 4, 48, 8 to 12, and 12 to 16. So in area A, for example, I showed a 40% chance of getting 12 to 16 inches of snow, and that was too high in some areas, but in other areas it wasn't. And then the real break point was around, you know, a 48 and then uh, 8 to 12. If you look at area B, look at the big drop-off here between 8 to 12, uh, 48 and 8 to 12 inches of snow in Area B around New York City, and so on and so forth. So that was the early first guess map. This was why I was so excited about it. You could see that the polar vortex was coming southward, uh, and then of course the models backed off on a little bit. But that's what that's why I was c c excited for a while. I just started detecting the system back on December 20th. Now this was the first call map. I saw I got starting putting down more numbers. I, as it turns out, I had too much snow in this map over southern New York State, but I did have the 8 to 12 inches down to southern New Jersey and the 4 to 8 inch band into Philly and central Pennsylvania, and 2 to 4 inches over much of northern Virginia and Maryland, which was not a bad forecast. And then um, this was the NAM, which came out the morning of the storm on January 2nd, and you could see that it actually had uh, that actually heavy area of snow. Uh, this is the 4 kilometer NAM, too, right here, as you can see it over southern New Jersey, and then this as well. But, of course, because of the high snow ratios, this was actually ended up around here somewhere. But, again, it was a pretty good model. Also notice that the 4-kilometer NAM did pick up the dry slot over uh, Pennsylvania. Not in over, it actually it wasn't over D.C., as we know, but it had it up in here. But it was, did a pretty good job in detecting that. So that was a good sign as well. And, of course, this was the uh, 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 WRF, the 
composite reflectivity and it showed on the morning of January 2nd that there would be significant snow for several hours over DC and Baltimore and that the forecasts were probably going to be too low. It also showed a lot of heavy snow over southeastern Pennsylvania and central and southern New Jersey and that was correct as well. In the last call map what I did was I shifted the two to four unfortunately north of DC but not north of Baltimore four to eight had eight to twelve about the same locations and changed the six to twelve a little bit and had the sixteen to twenty in Boston so overall this was a really good forecast I think and this was the actual official map as you can see you can compare that to that not bad not bad at all here's another forecast map and with more detail and again this is a pretty good forecast I would think now what's happening here in the future, there's the polar vortex coming down here on uh, uh, the today, and you can see it very clearly right here. And what's going to happen is this feature is going to drop down, and it's going to uh, cause a major Arctic outbreak. Whenever the polar vortex comes this far south, this is there it is for January seventh. Uh, you can see the vortex north of the Great Lakes, a huge trough over the eastern U.S., and we can see the temperatures. Look at these morning temperatures on Monday, January sixth. Look at the look at that minus. I, I can't read. It's minus 20 in, in Iowa, minus 16 in Chicago, something like that. Minus 20 in central Illinois. Very impressive. And then uh, you can even see the next day going into Pennsylvania. Notice the heart of the Arctic air doesn't really cross the uh, Blue Ridge that much. Uh, but the western half of Virginia and West Virginia are really going to freeze their butts off here, as will all of Pennsylvania and New York State. Very impressive Arctic outbreak. And you can see what happens is the polar vortex goes downward. You can see what happens. It really um, uh, drops southward. And look what it does. It swings around and eventually comes back up north. So this is now valid for January uh 8th and we can see the the polar vortex sliding back north into Canada and then finally by January 11th the polar vortex is way far back to the north and the ridge has come back over the southeastern United States and we're warming up so that movement of the polar vortex is pretty powerful this is the 6 to 10 day map as you can see and it has a big ridge on the west coast a big ridge on the east coast and a trough in the middle mostly over central Canada these are the temperature anomalies pretty warm in the eastern United States it's in eastern Canada not really warm, but pretty warm. And this is the 8 to 14 day. The trough is beginning to come back a little bit in the, to the U.S. We still have a ridge on the, just on the East Coast. And again, the warm temperatures leaving the East Coast. You can see that very clearly there. And as we look at this map here, this is the 234-hour polar vor uh, European. We can see the vortex, but we can see a new trough developing over the eastern United States. Let me highlight it in case you can't see this. Um, no, we'll do it this way. You can see it coming down here like this. Okay, so we still have a pretty good ridge here, so it's still pretty warm on January 14th over the eastern U.S., but as we go further in time, here's the GFS, and this is valid, uh, this is the Saturday GFS, uh, this is valid for January 16th, and this is a very reasonable looking map, there's, it's, there's a lot of data supports it, this is the GFS ensembles, this is not a severely cold map back to the weather pattern by mid-January, but it's pretty cold. I mean, it's not, we don't have a monster ridge here, but uh, we do have some ridging there, and the flow is going like this. That's a seasonally cold pattern. And then um, as we go further out in time, and this is the extended European and um, the CFS, and they actually go much more aggressive with the cold for January 18th, and then finally in the last January 25th is a big ridge on the west, or actually off the west coast in the eastern Pacific from Alaska, bringing the cold air down. So again, this is a pretty amplified pattern, um, and in the last week of January could get really cold again. In fact, if this turns out to be correct, and if finally we look at week three and week four. Uh, this is the CFS. It's been doing this now for three days in a row, so this is pretty impressive. Look at these temperatures. It starts getting cold January 18th to 24th, and that kind of matches this. But then look what happens on this week in here. Wow, pretty impressive cold. No doubt about that. Coming southward January 25, 26. So we'll see if that holds, but it looks like it's going to. And the uh, temperatures in terms of precipitation looks very dry over the northeast and on the west coast uh, beginning I'll see a little moisture here may not be interesting for east coast folks right in here coming up from the south we'll see if that actually works out or not anyway that's the report uh, this is meteorologist DT from weatherist.com I'll talk to you soon